Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a one o'clock presentation of starting on the correct course of action with your remodeling project. Uh, this is a booth uh, for NARI, which is the National Association of the Remodeling Industry. And uh, today we're going to spend about 45 minutes and we assume most of you folks are probably planning some sort of a home remodeling addition or renovation project. And we're going to touch on various subjects that help you understand how to engage that and plan that. Uh, that's going to range from budgeting to engaging in an architect or a design build for, uh, firm or a contractor. And there'll be a question and answer section for about the last 20 minutes. So we're going to take a little time and introduce uh, ourselves individually and then also um, talk about the topics. Then we'll dive into the topics and then we'll go to Q&A. Uh, so starting with me, I'm Doug Masters. My company is Masters Touch Design Build, which I founded in 1997. We're based in Holliston, Mass, and uh, we serve all Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, we specialize in residential design build services, uh, custom home renovations, full renovations, antique renovations, kitchens and bathrooms and that sort of thing. And Masters Touch Design Build also has an exterior home care division, which is windows, doors, roofing, painting, maintenance, and all that fun stuff. Uh, Glenn, over to you. Pass it to Sean. Uh, I'm Sean Cutting. I own uh, Cutting Edge Homes, uh, which is a company based out of uh, Ashland in the Metro West. Uh, we also have an office in Chatham uh, at the Cape. Uh, our firm specializes as well in design build, um, large scale uh, renovations, um, all the way down to kitchens and bathrooms again. Um, just a little bit of uh, experience from us. We're a uh, second generation company. My dad started the company and I took the company over uh, in 2012. Um, some of the other, uh, I'm part of the membership committee uh, for NARI and I'm also on the board of directors for the Better Business Bureau. Thanks for coming everyone. Uh, my name is Glenn Travis and I am the principal and owner of GMT Home Designs. My firm was established in 1999, and we specialize in residential design services. I have a staff of four, uh, which includes both architects and designers, and we typically do anywhere from 50 to 60 residential design projects per year. Uh, we are an award-winning design firm that has uh, a great appreciation for the importance of even the smallest of details and really relish tackling design challenges for all home styles from contemporary to the New England traditional architecture. Uh, recently, we have been involved in designing a net zero energy attainable development in Ashland and finished wrapping up a major whole house remodel in Newton Center where we turned a large ranch rambler home into a modern Georgian colonial. And uh, we were very excited to be involved with projects like these. Um, I did go to school locally. I went to Wentworth, received my Bachelor of Science in Architectural Engineering, and also served as president of the Eastern Massonary Chapter in 2012, chairman of the board in 2013, and currently serve as an advisor uh, to the current president. Uh, needless to say, we're excited to uh, be able to be here with you today and glad you joined us. I would like to take a moment and just share briefly about Eastern Massonary, if I could. Uh, some people haven't heard of it, and so part of our responsibility is just communicating uh, to homeowners what it what it's all about. Uh, Eastern Mass and Area is a nonprofit membership association dedicated to the professional remodeling industry, uh, representing professional remodeling contractors, suppliers, vendors, subcontractors, and service providers. Eastern Mass and Area stands out really as the voice of the industry and an ally to the region's homeowners. Uh, some of the things that we offer as an organization is a very high level of what we call a code of ethics that we require of all of our uh, members. Uh, we offer to our members best-in-class educational certifications and courses, uh, informative programming, uh, highlighting improved business practices, and then lastly engaging networking opportunities that allows our members to connect and share best practices. 
So that's a little bit about Eastern Macedonary, and you can find more information at easternmacedonary.org. Our goal for our time together, we've only got a few minutes really together, is to give you enough information that uh, you'll be able to understand the steps involved in the remodeling process and for you to also feel more confident about embarking in the remodeling process. So we have four general topics that we want to talk through with you a little bit, uh, broad strokes in these areas. The first one that Sean's going to speak to is pre-design. He'll get into all what that means before any kind of design starts. Budgeting your project. Doug's going to share a little bit about that, followed by what is design. Naturally, that'll be my area that I'll share with you. And lastly, who's going to lead your team? Uh, do we look at design building? What does that mean? Okay, with that said, I'm going to uh, pass the mic to Sean talk about pre-design. Thank you, Glenn. Um, so pre-design is really important for any company to understand what your goals are for the project. So, you know, I, 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 before coming out and meeting with any potential clients, we like to have them think about several questions. The first is, you know, what are the problems that you're trying to solve? Okay, um, and how will it change the way that you live in the home? Um, secondly, which is also very important, is how much should you invest? You know, what in, in, in that's, uh, in many ways to kind of look at that is um, how much are like homes in your neighborhood worth? Um, that may be uh, something that needs to be looked at if you are potentially thinking about selling in five to ten years. If it's something that you want to live there for the rest of your life, then it doesn't matter as much, but it is something that uh, certainly is a question that, that needs to be asked. Um, also, you know, things like how long you expect the project to take. Um, where will you live during construction if it's a large scale uh, renovation? And another important factor that we like our clients to understand is how much do you want to be involved? We have uh, clients who want to be intrinsically involved in picking out everything from the grout color. And we have other clients who say, hey, I just want to, you know, choose three, you choose three faucets and, and uh, and I'll pick the best one out of those. So those are some really important questions that we like to ask and we like you to have the answers to uh, before we even come out. And, and with that, one of the things that we really like our clients to do is to create a top 10 wish list and, uh, and actually write those things down. We, we find that um, people have been thinking about these projects so much um, and there's so many different ideas in their mind, um, but they've never actually written them down on paper. And the other thing that we find very interesting is sometimes that uh, the decision makers in the home don't always align on, on what the goals are for the project. So we want to make sure that, you know, uh, a lot of times we have, you know, uh, one decision maker write down their top 10 list, uh, the other decision maker write down their top 10 list and really compare those two to come up and, and be a united front uh, for what the project really wants to accomplish. When doing that, we need to kind of separate several things. You know, what needs to be done, you know, um, my, my window is rotted, or, um, you know, things that must be changed uh, that you can no longer live with. Uh, secondly is what you want to be done, and third is what you wish to be done. And so we really like to prioritize those three things and prioritize them in our top 10 list so that we can really better allocate the funds or the investment that you want to make into a project. Um, after recording that um, it, that information down, it's also helpful um, before you meet with any design professionals to have somewhat of an opinion of the design direction that you want. Um, so, you know, it, that used to be a lot more difficult than it is today. Um, you used to have to get all the design magazines and cut out pictures that you like and, and put them into a binder and and, and save them. Now there's a great website, house.com, that does all that for you and has, you know, millions and millions of pictures that they can kind of curate and you can save right into a lookbook, which makes it a lot easier um, for us to better understand the direction that you want your home to go. Because one of the things that's important that we like to get our clients to understand is um, we don't have to live in your home. You do. So we can certainly make suggestions. Uh, of what you would like to do, um, 
but it also ultimately comes down to the style that, that you really like. And a lot of firms can specialize in different styles. So you want to get a firm that really specializes in the style that fits for your home. Um, so in the pre-design, so after we've come out, come out and we've taken an, an, an initial look and you have your kind of top 10 list, our, our next job uh, as uh, a company that, that thoroughly looks at the full scale of the project is to understand what type of consultants are going to be needed for that project. You know, every project has a variety of different factors that we need to take into consideration, whether it's zoning, um, if you're in the suburbs, uh, whether it's zoning or historic or conservation, um, land surveyors, uh, in areas like uh, like Newton, um, they're very strict on you know drainage systems and replacing water and sewer lines. And so it's it's really important to find a company that's used to working in the area that you live because each town has different challenges um, to it and different costs associated with that. And we really want to make sure that those costs are talked about at the forefront versus the back end. And just a, a very quick example. Um, we do a lot of work um, in kind of the the Concord Sudbury uh, area when we're when we are in the in the suburbs, and so uh, that particular client had um, had engaged with another firm, and after engaging with that firm for several months, didn't realize that there was going to be about fifty thousand dollars of additional cost to get the project that they wanted permitted on the Sudbury River. Uh, it was an unfortunate situation for that client, but underlines the importance of making sure that at the onset asking the potential contractor or architectural firm that you're working with what challenges do you see to this property and what costs do I have to assume before I even get started um, someone may say I have you know I have a five thousand dollar five hundred thousand dollar budget which is a great budget and that's going to get me X amount of things but we need to understand the soft costs that go into being able to even get that project off the ground. So uh, that is an important thing uh, to really think about. And again, from understanding things uh, from a pre-design perspective, it's important for the firm to understand something like um, it, on a kitchen renovation, you may have to also replace your electrical service, or you may have to replace plumbing lines. And so it's important for those cost factors to be factored in at the beginning. The cabinets and the countertops that you're going to choose are important, but it's the other things that, that go into that. So, um, yeah. Um, so, Glenn will certainly get into, uh, uh, or Doug, Doug's going to get into more from a, a budget perspective. Um, so, just in summary, it's important to make sure that that um, all decision makers are on the same page, that you've actually kind of wrote, wrote some of these things down and, and, uh, and can really look at them. Um, and then also hiring a team and understanding what type of costs go in uh, to a project before you can even get started. Thanks, Sean, great. Uh, so directly parallel to pre-design is budget. And budget is always the elephant in the room. Sure is. So when, when our clients call us, we have uh, a set of questions that we ask, and after we get all the basics, name, address, and phone number, we say, what is your budget? Usually there's a pregnant pause on the line. Well, if I tell you what my budget is, your quote is going to be a dollar less than that. And that's really not the point of it. The point is to have an honest, open relationship and talk about the budget from the get-go. So before you call a contractor, an architect, or a design-build firm, you should know what your budget is. It's the number one driving factor of what you're gonna be able to do. And many of the points that Sean emphasized tie right in with budget. And so, how do you arrive at that? Well, there's several things you need to consider. Uh, number one, again, what's the value of your house? What can it tolerate in terms of a renovation and an improvement? If you live in a neighborhood where the houses are all worth four or five hundred thousand dollars, you're probably not going to be doing a two million dollar renovation. Uh, and so that's part of it. The other part is, uh, is this going to be something you're paying cash for? Is this going to be a construction loan, an equity loan? How are you financing it? So before you call a contractor, you should really sort out as much of that as possible and be ready to talk about budget in a transparent way right from the beginning. 
And sometimes what happens is we'll say, well, what's your budget? And folks say, well, honestly, we don't know. We've never done this before. Uh, and so can you help us with that? And that's a great conversation to have as well. So we're frequently out on jobs where people just don't know their budget yet. And we can come out and offer some suggestions of what your spending range might be. Whether it's something such as a whole home renovation, an antique renovation that might run 500,000 to a million, or a kitchen that could be 30 or 40,000 or anything in between. Uh, some people just have no experience at gauging what their budget should be. So it's really important that you know that from the beginning and you engage. Uh, we're, Glenn and I are actually uh, starting a project in Weymouth that started a couple of weeks ago, and we started development on that project two years ago. I got a call from a client. She uh, found us through House, the website, H-O-U-Z-Z, -Z, and if you don't have a uh, uh, scrapbook on there yet, definitely do that. Good point, Sean. But anyway, um, this client called us. She had a wonderful, wonderful set of blueprints done by a nice firm out of Boston. And now she was looking for contractors, and I sat down with her, uh, Glenn and I sat down with her and we looked, and she wanted to spend four or $500,000, and these blueprints were a million dollar job all day long. And she was crestfallen because how did she get that far into the process and then have a design that had no relation to what her actual budget was? And, and we said, well, didn't you ask the architect or have a conversation about the budget? Well, yeah, kind of, sort of, but you know, they didn't really want to talk about the budget, but we had these wonderful ideas and plans. Well, that doesn't do you any good, so you have to be careful. Make sure that whether you're hiring an architect, a design build firm, or a contractor, budget should be right up there with pre-design and what your goals are from the very beginning so that you don't waste time and money and end up six months or a year down the road with a wonderful set of plans that you just simply can't do. So make sure that uh, also within your marriage, if you're a married couple or a family, you know what the budget is as well. Because frequently, we'll go out on calls and he might say, well, this is a $50,000 job. And she might be saying, no, I think it was 150. So you need to work that out amongst yourselves as well. And another part of this, and Sean touched on it very well, is through the pre-design phase. You wanna make sure that you're including some contingencies in that budget. So let's say you're doing an addition renovation of your house. If your budget is 500,000, you really should probably aim a little lower than that so you have a little bit of a reserve fund. And I think what we find more often than not is people don't have an allotment aside for the blueprints and the design, for the interior design, and then after the job is done for furniture and accessories and everything else. So you can design and build a beautiful project, but it won't show well and it won't feel like a home if you don't go that extra mile and include the finishing touches that make it a beautiful space to live in. Uh, so those are, those are some of the points that I think people overlook the most and don't include in their budget. Um, when you do get somebody out to your property, drill down on the budget right away. Make sure you have that as one of the uh, most important points that you're talking about. Establish that budget and then stick with it. Uh, any good design build company or uh, an architect or a contractor, if they have some experience, should be able to talk to you in rough numbers about what budget range you should be setting aside for your project. If uh, either the homeowner or the uh, potential contractor is skirting around the issue, it's probably not going to go well. Um, and the other part of this is that through the design phase, as Sean was describing, the budget might change because the scope of work might change. And it is really important to find a company like Cutting Edge or GMT or Master's Touch who understands, uh, as Sean's point, what's it like to work in this town versus that town? There are towns we work in that we already know. This town has a lot more compliance issues, so we need to talk, talk to our potential client here about that right from the beginning and say, oh, don't forget, we're going to have another twenty or 30000 in soft costs to comply with the local zoning. Those things are really critical. You don't want to overlook that, particularly if you have a budget in mind and you're tight on that budget. Not everybody has an unlimited spending amount that they can put into their home, and nor does it make sense to. Uh, so make sure you do your research um, and understand how important that is. And don't play a shell game with your potential builder or architect or design build firm. Have a frank discussion 
about the budget from the beginning and then stick with it because most of our firms like us, we can value engineer a project and meet your budget. But we need to know that ahead of time so we're not giving you a $300,000 quote for a $100,000 budget. Um, I think, uh, Glenn, you're going to talk about the design phase now a little. And uh, that'll probably touch base a little bit on what Glenn and I have talked about as well. Excuse me, Sean and I. Thank you. All right. So the design phase, I will say that this, this part of the process should be a lot of fun. I mean, talking about money can be challenging for a lot of people, right? I mean, it's almost like, oh, do I really want to talk about money? Uh, yes, you do. It might be hard, but it's important to do. And then once you get to the design phase of the project, if we've lined up through pre-design, through budgeting, we know what we want to design to, we know the scope of work, then it's a really, this should be an enjoyable process from beginning all the way through to the end. I am very passionate about what I do. I love to take a simple blank sheet of paper and turn it into a piece of art. And when people have, when you think about you're in your home, usually it's your biggest investment, you want to do it right. I think a lot of people have X amount that they want to spend, but when you get to the design phase, we want to make sure that we're not over-designing like Doug talked about. So on the back of my business cards, uh, there's a number of architects that I uh, respect and appreciate the work that they do. Here's a couple of quotes for you just to think about when it comes to architecture. It says, the dialogue between client and architect is about as intimate as any conversation you can have. Because when you were talking about building a house or adding on to your house, you're talking about people's dreams. That's from Robert Stern. I am pay states it this way. You have to consider your client. Only out of that can you produce great architecture. You can't work in the abstract. Lee Cabousier states, states it this way. The home should be the treasure chest of the living. And then finally, an architect that a lot of us, I'm sure, have heard of, Frank Lloyd Wright, famous uh, architect here in this country, he states it this way. All fine architectural values are human values, else not value. And so I do find, you might find this comical, but I find myself at times being a marriage counselor in these design meetings. Because usually I find two people marry their opposites or partners. My wife is completely opposite of me, but what she likes for her tastes are oftentimes different than mine. And you gotta meld those together so that it all works together in a seamless fashion. So for me as a design firm, a big part of what I do and need to do is listen to you. You know, I have a very detached point of view. You live in this house, you know what the issues are, the things that you're concerned about. I wanna draw that out of you. Because in the end, I wanna make sure that we're hearing what are your needs? And what are the things that are your wants? And in the end, a lot of people have that wish list too. So if we can incorporate a little bit of each of those, then I think you're gonna end up with a home that you're gonna love and enjoy for many, many years to come. On my website, one of the things that I have people look at is a list of questions that you need to consider before you start your design build project. There's 20 questions to consider. Um, I'll list a few of these for you. Is number one, describe your current home. You bought this place, so clearly there are some things that you love about the place you bought, I hope. So what are those things? Is it a particular built-in in the dining room you love? And then you know, the flip side, what are the things that you don't like about your current home. And if that list is so intense, maybe you do consider moving and going into a new situation. But I do find when you do that, you still want to put your stamp on that new place. You still want to do some things to make that house your home. Do you want to build a new home? Or do you want to renovate your current home? Uh, do you need more room? Is your lifestyle changing? In other words, you've had kids, the kids are now in college, Maybe now you're empty nesters. Do you want to reconfigure some of those bedrooms that aren't really being utilized into a first floor junior master suite? Kind of consider long term, what do we want to do with this space? To be frank, the question you should ask yourself as well is, how much time and energy are you willing to invest to maintain your home? I think there's 
you know, there's so many products here even at this home show that are maintenance-free products. These are things that we need to talk through during the design phase. Sean mentioned this. I love the house.com site. It is awesome. It is the homeowner's friend because sometimes it's hard to visualize, right? What it is that you want to do. And if you look at some pictures, say you want to add a, a really great mudroom in your house. You've got three kids, you have book bags, shoes everywhere. It's pop. You just, I, we've got to figure out what we can do to meet this need. It's amazing to me how many mudroom projects that we've been involved in in the last few years. And it helps you to organize your space so you can have some sanity and not walk, feel like you're tripping on all these shoes coming into the house. You follow me? And so there's every project has distinct questions that should be asked for those given spaces. In other words, if you've got a house with a living room, but say you don't have a family room, is it important that you have another space where you can gather? Because my young kids are now teens and they need a space separate from us as adults when they come over. Uh, again, I think it's imperative that when you ultimately move forward in design, that you start with schematic design, which involves uh, 3D renderings are extremely helpful. So when you have, uh, I find that usually out of uh, the couples I work with, there's one that says, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. I don't need to see anything. And then the spouse looks at them and go, but I need to see it all. I can't understand what's going on here. And so there's usually one cup, which is, there's not a right or wrong, it's just that we want to meet that need. And so for GMT as a design firm, we use a very high-end visual 3D software called Chief Architect that takes all the guesswork out of how this space is going to look. And what it does for Sean and what it does for Doug, it helps them to properly price the project because we know what it's going to look like during the design phase. And finally, to wrap it up with design, you really do need a really thorough and complete set of construction drawings. Because really, it's a language that you're speaking to all the players involved, the building departments, the subcontractors, you as the homeowner, to clearly communicate, this is what's going where, this is what's changing with the framing, these are the different heights, et cetera, et cetera. It's really important that you have a complete set of construction drawings. And in the end, just in way of reminder, take a deep breath, have fun. This is not a perfect industry. Challenges will be there. It's how you kind of work through those challenges and help each other come to a really great resolution with the things that you have in mind to do with your home. Sound good? All right. All right, the last part I think we're all gonna speak on. Who wants to speak to this first? Sean, all right. One wide design build. Yeah. So um, each each company kind of really specializes in their own field of what they think is best. I think the people that are that are here on this stage uh, can speak the most to uh, a design and build method. Um, what's great about design and build is uh, it's typically uh, meant for a client who does have a budget. Now again, we have clients that have three million dollar budgets, but it is still a budget. We can't spend four million. And we have clients that have a hundred thousand dollar budget that we can't spend 150. So no matter what your budget is, there's still a budget. Design build works really well to that because we always want to get, as everyone has kind of mentioned on this panel, we want to get the elephant in the room, which is the budget and design to that budget. See, what, what happens when you do a traditional architecture method, the last time I checked, and we do work with some great architects, they're, they're not in the audience, so that's good, but last time I checked, they're not checking receipts from National Lumber or Sudbury Lumber or a, a anywhere else. Um, so it's, they're typically using square footage numbers that are ancient, extinct, don't exist anymore. Um, and we're in an environment now where guys' prices haven't changed in 10 to 15 years, that now the, the economy is better, their price is increasing. So it's, it's really important from that perspective and why we on, on this panel, I think, like Design Build is because we're initially going in and visiting with a client and surveying their space. And to, to, to at least for, I can speak to our company, um, we're putting that top 10 list down. 
and we're putting budgetary numbers associated with that top 10, and there's no shame in not being able to do all 10 things at once. We have many clients that we're doing projects you know, with, we'll do five projects in a decade together. Um, but it's important to look and assess those things um, before kind of jumping into it and before wasting, uh, wa wasting a lot of time. So um, there are certainly different methods and in, in ways of, of doing things. Um, if you do have an unlimited budget, um, the best wow. way, to, way to do it may be an architecture firm that's just gonna charge you hourly. And, if, and you're gonna incur tens, and thousand, tens of thousands of dollars worth of architecture uh, fees and that may be okay because that that may get you the ultimately designed space that a team of architects have spent you know hours and hours and hours on. Most projects that we see in this area are not projects that that's conducive to. You know whether you're doing a whole house renovation or you're doing a significant addition, a lot of times that can be done with a design build team um, where the cost is set up front and we're designing to that cost versus designing and then figuring the cost out later and I and I use that a crude example but I think it's one that that makes a lot of sense is you know if you go to the car dealership and you test drive you know and you say hey I have a fifty thousand dollar budget and they let you test drive a hundred and fifty thousand dollar car of course you're gonna like that car better um, but then you you know then you then you have to go back to the car that you can actually afford and so that's where I think the the design build method uh, works really well to to understand what the client is looking for and design to the budget that they're looking for. If I can add to that, put it simply uh, with design build, it determines what your project is going to look like, you know, the 3D renderings, the, the floor plans, the elevations, and manages what it's going to cost all at the same time so that the design team and the build team are working in concert in collaboration with you. And so we want to come back with a design that meets your needs and also meets your needs financially speaking. I think that is really critical. So even this week, I had several people call my office and wanted to do certain projects. They had a budget in mind and oftentimes I'll ask the question, well, where did you develop that budget? Is that what you have saved for a project? But it doesn't always correlate to the type of project that they want to have done. You follow me there? So in other words, say they have $100,000 and they want to do a full gut kitchen addition mudroom, that's not going to be $100,000, I promise you. That's probably going to be more like $200,000 plus. And so it's my job to educate homeowners on the reality of what things cost and why, so that when you dive into a project with someone and you're in investing dollars in design fees, the expectation is already clear that we know what we're getting for the dollars that we're spending. Anything you want to add? In? I do. Yes, thanks. Uh, so I think to summarize the distinction between or among design build somewhere in the middle, a contractor over here, and an architectural firm over here, uh, the distinct advantage of design build is you're getting both rolled into one. And so generally, if I'm going to go out and interview a potential client and they don't know what their budget is, but they have a dream, we can usually sit down for one or two hours, we'll have an interview session, and by the end of that, we can have a discussion of what a rough budget might be. Now, let's say you're doing that with an architect, and to Sean's point, they're using square footage numbers and so forth, but they're not managing this work on a daily basis and understanding the contractor part of it. So it's a lot more esoteric for them. Well, there's a 200 square foot addition. Maybe it's $300 a square foot. Let's do some blueprints. And to my earlier point about budget, you end up in not a good place. With design build, generally what's going to happen is we're going to come up with a basic, basic schematic design of what your project is. And we're going to take that to our building department, our framers and everybody else before we come back to you and tell you whether we're on budget or not. So we're not going to fall in love with this beautiful 3D rendering and keep designing it and keep going down that rabbit hole until we've justified that against the building cost to make sure that we're all navigating toward a happy place at the end which is this beautiful design and it's on budget. So that's what the essence of design build is, is start with a budget, 
start working on design, and arrive at a place at the end where you've got what you want in terms of the design, you've had a lot of fun with the process, and now you're ready to get into a final contract and start the work. And one other point that I'm going to make is, regardless of who you hire, when it comes time to hire a contractor or builder, if you don't already have a design build company engaged, make sure you cross all the T's and dot all the I's of that design in your selection process and your budgeting. You don't start building a skyscraper until the foundation is done and all the plans for everything up to the 100th floor is figured out to a T. The same thing has to apply in residential, and unfortunately, often it doesn't when you hire a contractor and things are figured out as you go. That's why a lot of the contracting industry sort of has a reputation like used car salesmen. It's because they're not professional and they're not planning out these projects. So you end up with a three or four month, $100,000 job being a 12 month, $200,000 job, just a disaster, and you hear about that all the time. So the design build process, properly engaged will insulate you from that and protect you from that. And don't start a job until you've got that final contract figured out. Uh, ready for question and answers? You, you want to add something? Absolutely. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to the get to the Q&A now. I think just to one point that, that Doug said, and um, we've spent more time on budget than I think either of us really wanted to. I think to, to stress, we you know, this is a fun process. You know, your home is your biggest investment. So um, we want to. This the, there is a lot of fun that can be involved with that. I, there's a great piece of advice that I got, um, which you know, people hear uh, these horror stories, um, which is why trade organizations like the Better Business Bureau and NARI exist. Um, the biggest breakdown in those horror stories that you hear is lack of the communication, whether it's lack of communication from a realistic budget, lack of communication from a realistic schedule lack of communication from design selections. When you hire and look are, are looking at professional companies, most of the time their costs are gonna be very similar. It's gonna come down to who you think can most, can best execute your project and who you think you can get along with best. The companies that are here on this stage, we all offer an industry leading five year warranty. It's, we're not gonna be just together for a month or two on, on these projects. These are projects that we have to be together and collaborating with for years. So. It's important, and, and I think for whatever reason in this industry, there is a lack of communication. Um, you know, guys are working hard all day and they don't want to answer the phone at set six or seven o'clock at night. You know, um, you want to look for an organization, depending on your expectation level, um, that has systems and procedures in place that, you know, the, the lead carpenter is not the one who's answering the phone at seven o'clock at night. But what comes along with that is a cost. And so one of the things to, and this was my point to, to Doug, um, we like to, there is a couple ways of looking at cost. You look at a, a, a project and you look at plans and someone says, okay, I can do that for 200,000. Another company may say, okay, I can do that for 220,000. You wanna be very careful about going with a, a lowest bid because um, there may not be everything included in that that another company may have included. So what happens in these horror stories is you actually spend more than what you were, had originally anticipated with a more professional company because things weren't weren't properly planned in the port. So. Okay, we're gonna do questions and answers now and I'd like to uh, take the mic out there and then bring it back up for the answers if that's okay because we want everybody to hear them. Uh, before I do, there's a NARI table over there, our business cards are on there, and there's some additional brochures and so forth. So feel free to take that stuff, and uh, let's go to some questions. Hi. Okay, so I had, uh, I think one of you mentioned doing an extensive renovation rather than demolishing the house and then rebuilding it. I think you said from a ranch to a colonial or something of that kind. So how do you decide, you know, this, this thing should be torn down or this thing should be renovated and what are the pros and cons of Great question. Who wants to take that one? Appreciate the question. So what I would say is, I want us, uh, mankind, to be as green as possible. 
So whenever possible, do not tear the house down. Let's, if it's got good bones, more often than not, it does. Let's add to it, and you're more green in nature by just the very nature of remodeling. You're saving the planet by adding on versus the whole complete teardown, in my strong opinion, okay? So I think part of it is, all right, you've got some needs where you've outgrown that ranch, that's fine, but now we need to talk realistically about what do we want to invest in this house, and can the neighborhood, you know, if you needed to sell it for whatever reason because of an emergency, how much could you really recoup based on where you're at in that neighborhood? So if you're in a neighborhood of, of capes and ranches, and you want to do a colonial, they usually do a mile radius for the comps. You just got to be wise in how far you go with that kind of project. And so be conservative is all I'm trying to say. And you want to add to that? Yeah. yeah. It, you know, uh, to Glenn's point, we, we do want to be very conscious of the environment. And, and I think that for our company, um, we're doing nine uh, renovations to every teardown. When you are specifically deciding whether a home is, is conducive to a teardown or not, you, there are things that are extremely expensive to fix that is just an assumption of how much you care about. You know, whether the foundation is beyond repair. Well, it's a lot of money to lift the house and move it and replace the foundation. Uh, how much rot is, is, is there? Um, you know, things like, you know, ceiling heights. You know, you, you, if you have seven and a half or eight foot ceilings, you, you're not going to be able to put nine foot ceilings into, into that home. So um, I, I think that those are some of the main factors, the bones of the house that needs to be the decision of whether a house should be torn down or not. And just one more point on that. Uh, clearly, depending on the towns you live in, there's a lot of teardowns these days. And I think we're uh, all of the same mind here that sometimes that's a shame. We're filling up landfills so we can build bigger and bigger houses and so forth. And I think there is a trend in the industry toward uh, having better built but more manageable living space. Uh, so you don't necessarily need six or 7,000 square feet. What if you have two or 3,000 square feet? It's very comfortable and very energy efficient. And the biggest thing for all of us, and Glenn mentioned this, is if we don't have to tear it down and put it in a landfill, and then all of the carbon footprint that's associated with all the raw materials that go into building a new house. I, I liken it to what is really more green, buying a brand new Prius or a three-year-old Honda with a four-cylinder that's a recycled car, which is really gonna have a uh, smaller carbon footprint over 10 or 15 years. So those are things that we look at. And then of course, uh, somebody can come out and also look at a project and say, this is going to cost X or 2X or 3X to tear down versus renovate. It can cost a little more to renovate, but usually that's the, air, uh, the uh, direction we're gonna err on. Another, uh, sorry, another question? Somebody out there must have one. Okay. <laughs> we have uh, about another five or 10 minutes, so if anybody has anything. Another one? Perfect. Maybe we should move you up on the stage. You had mentioned uh, one of you going from one kind of one style to another style. I think it was, uh, could you speak to that? I mean, how much does that change things? So the question was converting a house from one style to another, perhaps a ranch to a colonial. I'm going to give that one to you, Glenn. I mean, part of that is what visually do you like the looks of? I mean, there are different different styles of homes, you know, across this country. Where we live, we've got a lot of traditional New England homes, you know, city colonials, capes, ranches, not as many bungalows, prairie style homes. We're seeing more and more contemporary homes. And it's going to come down to, you know, a number of factors. But if you've got a ranch style home, there's a lot that you can do in converting that to a contemporary home. Part of that has to do with your window selections, your choice of materials, how it's laid out. Uh, it's incredible from, a, from an architect's point of view, you know, there are a number of different things that can happen uh, to really make it, you know, your dream home without having to tear the thing down or go up even. 
And so I, part of that is the listening part that we need to do in the pre-design phase. Is Ian, what are your needs? And if you come back and say, you know what, I just don't love the look of my house, what can we do? Even simple things like adding a portico or a farmer's porch completely changes the look of a house and gives it the curb appeal that you're wanting, that you might not have even thought of. And so part of our responsibility is to flesh out what do you love, what, are your, what do you like, and really talk through those things, and then put a budget to those things to see in the end if it will work. Hopefully that answered your question. And again, just specifically to that point, uh, Glenn and I are we're working on the project that he did mention before where we changed a, uh, a ranch into a modern Georgian colonial. Um, what's great about the 3D software is we can really understand how that looks and how it changes it. On a project that's to a smaller scale, uh, one in Wellesley, we're changing a Gambrel to a colonial. So these are all things that can be done without having to completely tear down a house. Okay, and now uh, we're starting to run out of time, but I want to add one more thing to that, is that sometimes folks will call us and think, all right, I want this style of house, this is what I have now. And there'll be a real paradigm shift as we go through that initial design meeting, because sometimes it's about bringing out the best of what you already have and really rethinking it. And so I think there's some real merit in that as well. And again, we, I'm a certified green builder binary, so I always look at the greenest route that we can take through that process first, and then we'll uh, consider alternative options. And the greenest route is always, let's look at the infrastructure that your house has and try to make the most of that before we reinvent the wheel. And so we've taken ranch homes or colonials or what have you, and just brought out the best in them, and that really helps minimize the budget as well. I just wanna uh, say thank you for coming. You know, obviously we appreciate, your time is valuable, and uh, we're grateful you took the time to be with the three of us today. And uh, so again, we appreciate you being here uh, with us. Yes, uh, appreciate that. And um, Cutting Edge Homes has a booth uh, in the 700 aisle, 704. Um, we have some uh, project examples. So if you have any more uh, questions or would like to talk further, uh, we're certainly available there. And you know, we just want to thank Nari um, uh, for having uh, these uh, lecture series. I think it's great that no matter what contractor you choose, you choose one who's really in the industry because they love it and they're in the industry because they really want to create and value creating something really beautiful uh, for our clients. So thank you. And again, our cards are over there as well. And so if any of you want to contact any of us directly with any specific questions or follow-up, grab a card, send an email over, and we'll be happy to help you out. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend.